So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Mediterranean Spain with myself, Lauren. I work at WSET School in London. I've been teaching online now for quite some time. I teach Spain at the diploma level. That's our level four qualification that we do in Wines, but also teach it at, the, at other levels as well. Um, I do have a big passion for Spain. One of reasons for that was um, a level three scholarship that I got through doing my um, my WSET level three and I won a trip across northern Spain so I will be actually using some photos um, that I took on that trip as part of this presentation and um, yeah it really um, ignited a passion for me um, about Spain so I'm very pleased to be sharing that with you this evening. Now I've cheated a bit I did um, I hoped to have a glass of Mediterranean Spanish wine with me, but I didn't have any. Um, so um, I have actually something from Spain too, but it isn't Mediterranean, it's a bit further in, but this is um, from Rueda and it's a Vadejo, which is also very lovely. But unfortunately, I won't be going into detail about that wine and where it's made, etc. So let's see what I mean by Mediterranean Spain. Okay, so um, I'm going to have a little little overview, just a little bit of background, um, put it into context, wine, wine making, um, grapes, just to kind of overview, but then look at specifically at some regions and we'll be able to really focus in on what makes them different, what makes them unique, and why we should be seeking out these wines from these particular parts of the world. So I've got a map of Spain here, not every single um, Denominación Dorehen is on here, but I will be zoning in and, and looking at looking at some specific ones. But um, if you've ever done a, a Spanish lecture with me, um, I do talk about the topography, um, the fact that it is such an incredible country with regards to the diversity and actually its own unique um, styles of wines and grape varieties that they grow. So it is the second most mountainous country in Europe after Switzerland, and a lot of that is the Mesita in the centre here, so going from Madrid and then all the way um, further north, we've got the foothills of the Pyrenees. That will be quite important when I'm talking about Mediterranean Spain in just a bit. Um, so you can see a lot of it's very, very mountainous. Um, there are loads and loads and loads of different grape varieties grown there. And we'll notice actually that you see generally see more in the kind of northeast that are, are international grape varieties. And then as we go further south and further inland, you'll see that we have more native grape varieties. But there's um, a little chart here, so the top six grape varieties, and actually it's quite surprising because the most planted grape variety, so with over 20%, is Eren. And Eren is a white grape variety, and we're not going to talk about Eren very much because it's mostly grown in La Mancha, which I'm not classing as Mediterranean, um, but it is actually used a lot for distillation or, um, and for brandies de Jerez, for example. So um, it's grown a lot and but it's not really a wine you'll see outside of Spain very much. They do make some sort of more table wines with it but it's it's not the most exciting grape variety. Um, Tempranillo on the other hand, um, lots and lots of Tempranillo, it's got many many different synonyms, I'll talk about a couple of those synonyms when we go to the particular places and it makes a whole range of styles of wine so um, we should be fairly, if you're into Spanish wine you should have heard of Tempranillo it is like the main grape variety in places like Rioja, Ribera de Duero, Oro, etc. But we are actually going to parts of Spain where it's not the main grape variety, but it is still grown in many, many parts. Bobal. Now, you may not have heard of Bobal, but look, it's the third most planted grape variety. And we will definitely be visiting regions where that is grown. And we'll be thinking about how that is made into some really quality wines now. It used to be mass, more sort of mass produced more table wines, but there's some really exciting expressions coming out at the moment. Garnacha, you might have thought Garnacha might be further up the list there, but that is the fourth most planted grape variety, third most planted black grape variety, and we'll definitely be going to some very important regions for Garnacha. Macabal, all over, so this is our white grape variety, it's all over Spain, and we'll see how it's treated differently in the different kinds of styles of wines that it makes then Monastrel as well. So those are our six top grapes, but I will be showing you lots and lots of different grape varieties, but I probably won't talk about them in too much detail because some of them are very, very small, small, small plantings. Right, um, so I'm just going to 
mute. There we go. Um, right. So styles of wine. Well, if you have, um, again, if you've had any lectures with me, you'll know that I'm a big, big fan of sparkling wine. So we will be discussing the sparkling wines coming out of Spain and particularly Mediterranean Spain. So there's a few labelling terms to get your heads round, which I will introduce you to if you don't know them already, or maybe if you're a diploma student, a, a bit of recap there for you. Um, so we've got sparkling wine, lots and lots and lots of sparkling wine. We've got white wines, we've got rosés, we've got reds, we've got big, big alcoholic, big alcoholic reds, we've got lighter reds, we've got aromatic whites, we've got oak whites, we've got um, we've got fortified wines as well. So if you've, if you've ever had sort of muscat from the uh, um, Iberian uh, Peninsula, you'll, you'll know that it's very popular grape variety made in a sweeter style and fortified as well. So we'll be looking at where we can find those. And these are all, I'm talking about all in the Mediterranean side. So what am I talking about when I say Mediterranean Spain? Well, let's have a look. So I figured that it kind of has to have more of a Mediterranean climate to be Mediterranean Spain and generally along the Mediterranean. So I'm going to be focusing on Catalonia, very much focusing on Catalonia. And of course, you can't talk about Catalonia without talking about Carva. So I'll be explaining about the Carva that comes from Catalonia in particular. I am going to include Somontano because Somontano, I think, has got enough Mediterranean influence to be classed as Mediterranean. And I think it's a really interesting denominating Andorra hen in Spain as well. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I will be going into quite a bit of detail in Catalonia. There's lots and lots of DOs and a DOQ. So I will explain a little bit about those. And then we're going to come down south here um, and I'm going to talk about the Valencia and the Murcia um, wider areas. So we can see including um, Uccel, Reconia, Alicante, Yecla, Jumilla. And then I thought, well, why not? You know, if you're going to go on holiday in Spain and you want to go to the Mediterranean, you may well go to the Balearic Islands. So uh, Mallorca as well. I'll have a little, little talk about what you can expect to find there. So yeah, we're just basically doing a little trip all the way around here. Now, I do class Jerez as a Mediterranean climate, even though it is on the Atlantic, but I've done a session on that. So if you want to know about sherry wines from Jerez, then you can watch um, a video that I've done previously. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Carva because I always think it's nice to start with a sparkling wine. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the reputation um, behind Carver, um, the future of Carver, and it's always, I think, a good, I think Carver is a really interesting topic to debate because there's quite a lot to talk about with it. It's suffered, its reputation has suffered, but there's lots of things happening at the moment which I think will bring it back up, but it's going to be interesting to see what actually happens. Now, I can see the title here is Traditional Method Sparkling Wines because Carver isn't the only traditional method sparkling wine that I'm going to talk about. And I'm just going to do a quick recap of what traditional method means. So traditional method is when you do a second fermentation to make a sparkling wine in the bottle. Okay, so you make your base wine, so like a dry wine, that will go into a nice thick bottle. You will add yeast and sugar to start a second fermentation, so that will be sealed. If you have a look here, you can see that we've got these crown caps on these bottles, so that'll be sealed. And then um, a second fermentation will take place. It usually takes place um, over a few weeks. After that second fermentation, you've got the dead yeast cells in the bottle and given enough time, they will give off characteristics of pastry, bread, dough, these yeasty notes. And that's what we call autolysis because it's the breaking down of the dead yeast cells in the bottle. Now, you need quite a lot of time for that to happen. Okay, and after that, then you have to go through this process of riddling um, and disgorgement, which is basically getting the dead yeast cells into the neck of the bottle and then out of the bottle. And then you will probably add some sugar right at the end to make the wine nice and balanced. Now, that's the traditional method. So it's, a, it's quite a complex method. It's the most labor intensive method, but it's the way they make carver. It's the way they pretty much make um, all of the sparkling wines in this part of the world. Now, I'm being very specific about where we are in this part of the world. And San Sardoni da Noia, 
is, uh, is one of the most important towns in Penedès, um, where many of the wineries are. Um, so 95% of what you get, carver wise, is from Penedès, which is within, um, within the larger denomination de or DO, as I refer to them, of uh, Catalonia. So pretty much very, very vast majority of your carver comes from Catalonia, more specifically Penedès, more specifically Sansadoni de Noia. Okay, now carver. Um, there's two big, big producers, you've probably heard of them, Cordonier, Freshnay, okay, they um, make millions and millions and millions of bottles of wine. Um, the quality level can range from very easy drinking, quite simple, okay, so not very expensive, all the way up to quite expensive, complex wines. And the reason they can become more complex, well, the fruit, you want really good fruit to make um, the better wine, but also the amount of time after the fermentation when the bottle is in contact with those dead yeast cells. Now the thing about kava is there's a minimum aging requirement on the leaves which is nine months and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. So um, what I'm, so I'm just going to look at some of the grape varieties that they grow to make kava because it's local grape varieties are generally most of what is being used. So Macabal is also known as Fiora if you're in Rioja that's 36%. They tend to grow that um, at slightly lower altitudes. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, a little bit more about Penedes and where they grow certain grapes in just a bit. Um, so Macabal, 36%, generally grown a little bit lower down. It has kind of apple and citrus notes. Okay. Um, Charolo, which is tends to be grown a little bit higher. Um, that can have quite floral notes, but also can give an earthiness um, to the wines. Um, if it doesn't ripen quite well enough, it can give almost a slightly rubbery note. So um, you might find that in the, in the less expensive carvers. Um, Parayada is grown quite high up and that's pretty floral, okay, and it's got some finesse and, and tends to have good acidity, particularly when grown quite high up. Because we are in quite a warm part of Spain, you do generally need to harvest these grapes a little bit earlier to retain that acidity, but it isn't uncommon to acidify later down the line. So that's your kind of your main grape varieties, particularly in Penedes, okay? Um, but they are permitted to use Chardonnay. So you can get um, Chardonnay, 100% Chardonnay carvers is absolutely possible. They are also permitted to use Garnacha Tinta and Pinot Noir, and they make white wines as well with those, like they do in Champagne. They use black grapes to make white wines. And Trepa, they use um, to make rosé carver, what we might call rosado. Now, the difference is, well, I'll talk about this on the next slide, but just to point out the pictures here. So we've got... Um, I've got some bottles here that just going, it's just the end of the um, traditional method process. Um, so they were getting ready to have the lids taken off and the, um, um, and, um, and basically the, the mm -hmm. cells to come out and go out, go out to market really. And then here, so this is, you can see they've got Charolot vineyards. You see that written on the sign there. This is from a producer called Villa Now. You can actually buy a lot of their wines in, in, in many um, merchants, supermarkets included, and this is the wine, quite a modern um, setup there. So, um, um, very, very lovely um, carvers they, they produce. So, um, I'm just gonna now go through some of the, um, please excuse my photo there, I couldn't help myself when I was wandering around the, um, the winery. Um, so, we've got some labeling terms here. So, carver, so your basic carver, that is nine months m uh, minimum requirement. And so, usually is, about nine months okay now nine months aging on the leaves so before you um you riddle and you disgorge that nine months um is not going to give you autolytic character you're not going to get lots and lots of bready biscuity notes you're probably going to get more of a fruity um quite a light intensity fruity 
style of wine okay not going to be very expensive so that's your basic carver interestingly with carver you can have vintage and you have non-vintage but most of it tends to be vintage even though it's not stated on the label because unlike in places like champagne where they have vintage variation so the years are quite different and you can get years that are really good and years where you don't get such healthy grapes you don't really get that problem so much um, in um, in this part of Spain so they tend to really use the grapes harvested and also it costs a lot of money to keep wine in in them um, in the cellars and those reserve wines for a long time so, and there's no real need to do that so much so that's your carver now carver reserver okay is 15 months minimum aging so you can see we're now going to should start to get a bit of that autistic character a bit light light autolysis there so a little bit of that yeastiness and then gram reserver is 30 months minimum aging so we're definitely going to start seeing more of that kind of bready biscuity notes the kind of things we might expect more from champagne and um, but they're not allowed to add a lot of sugar so these aren't allowed to be sweet styles of carver and um, the gram reserver must always be the drier style so i'm having a look now at labeling terms you would expect so brute so brute typically with carver would be around seven or eight grams per litre of sugar and that's what they add at the end okay so it's not very much and it's just there to kind of give a bit of balance enhance some of the fruity characteristics coming through but it should be perceived as dry on the palate semi secco now we are talking about adding quite a considerable amount of sugar to make a sweet style but it's not overly popular in semi secco more sort of germany they like that style um, and Brut Nature is no sugar added whatsoever. So there's more of that coming out at the moment. But to be honest, these wines aren't as acidic as your, um, your champagne wines or your English sparkling wines. They don't really need to add that much sugar in the first place. So Brut Nature, I think, will probably be a growing category um, with Carver. Now, because Carver has got or has had a bit of a, a bit of a sullied reputation because you do get these very inexpensive ones particularly in this country i don't know what it's like where you are because i know you're based all over the place but in the uk we have a thing where you'll go into um, a supermarket and you'll see carver for like four pounds a bottle sometimes it's on offer for even less than that i can't believe how cheap that is um, i mean if we think about four pounds it's probably the equivalent of around five euros okay so it's really not expensive and then um, and I think what they do a lot is they, what we call a loss leader. So they try and get people to come into the shop, buy this carver because it's so cheap, and then hopefully they'll buy some other stuff as well. So that just doesn't help with the reputation for carver at all because you just think, oh, because it's when, when things are too cheap, we, we, we do, we'll question it, don't we? Um, and it loses its value as well. You just think, well, it's, it must be really not very good. It must be a very easy way to make it. And we know it's the traditional method. So, you know, it's a bit worrying. So it has really suffered there. And then when things are priced too cheaply, who wants to spend more on them? Not that suddenly said, well, you know, it was too cheap. I'm happy to spend another four pounds on it. And that's not going to happen. So um, when you start selling things cheaply, it's very difficult um, to get the prices back where they should be. So having these other categories should help with that. You can see that you're going to have to have much better fruit in order to withstand further aging. Um, so I've, I've missed out Rosado here. So Rosado basically means rosé. Um, rosé rules for Carva are much stricter than in Champagne. In Champagne, you can blend white wine and red wine together to make a rosé. Absolutely not. To make a rosé in Carva, Carva, then you have to have skin contact. Okay, So you have to get that colour coming from the skin of the red grape. You can't just blend red and white wine together. So another labelling term, which is quite recent, so 2017, is Carva de Barraje. Um, and Carva de Paraje basically means from a specific place. Okay, so we're talking about a Paraje is an estate or a lieu de, or like a name place, and it has to be made there, bottled there, and you can see that the aging requirement there is even higher than your Grand Reserva. So they're really saying, look, we're going to have the premium, really top quality stuff out there and make it clear what it is. So 10 year old vines as well, so they have to be really quite old vines getting right down the roots down there um, to get the water and be um, a bit more concentrated so there's generally lower yields and you're not allowed to acidify so with your general carver you'd acidify but with these no acidification so they must be picked at a time when you're going to get really good acidity 
in the first place. These also can't be sweet either. So that's your carbon dioxide. Now this was produced, this labelling term, um, as a response to dissatisfaction of a lot of kava producers. However, it wasn't enough. So we will see that um, there's a couple of other labelling terms for traditional method of sparkling wines. So one is classic penedet. So coming away from the wider area of, um, of carver, actually being specific, classic penedes, and that has to be organic, um, 15 months minimum ageing. I have to say, I haven't had one of these wines. I'm, I'm going to look out for them, but there's not that many of them out there. And this was kind of in response to Reventos, who broke away from carver, and they refused to call themselves carver. They wanted to create um, a denomination on Dorahen from Plansa Adorni Danoya, um, but it's a bit of a mouthful, so, and that hasn't really um, happened. But what has happened is a group, um, it's around 10 producers, and even those small producers, they're smaller um, on, the, on the higher, bigger scale of, of small, um, and they came together and they created their own term, and you can see it on this label here, Corpinat, and that means the heart of Penedes. And they gave their own rules and regulations around how their wine should be. So if you pick up a bottle of Gramona, this is one, one particularly notable producer, Recorado is another one. Um, the same bottle of wine um, before 2019, I think in fact, no, probably before about 2018, would have Carver written on it because they were under that Nomination Dorahen. But now, no, it's got Corpinac. There's no mention of Carver on that bottle anywhere. Okay, so it's a completely different category. But these have always been top producers with loads of integrity. I'm not saying others don't, but they often have been um, using grapes um, that are from particularly great sites, doing lots of manual stuff as well, very manual um, hand harvesting, because actually with carver, it's not a requirement to hand harvest. Most of it is hand harvested, but I'm seeing more and more where they're using machines. Um, but the, some of the, um, the stipulations for this style of wine is 90% of the local grape varieties, so those grape varieties, Macabal, Charolo, Periada, that I mentioned before, um, they've got their different minimum aging requirements. It's a bit of a headache, isn't it, really? 15 months here, 10, 9 months there, um, but they go up to 60 months. So within their portfolio, they will have different levels of, um, of carvers. Again, has to be organic, and like I said, these are hand harvested. Now, I think these, um, you know, carver, you pick and choose. You know, if you're in, in, in Spain, if you're lucky enough to be in that part of Spain and you can go to some merchants, even some really nice supermarkets, you can get some really top quality stuff for not very much money. And this is another reason why I'm really enjoying talking about Mediterranean Spain is because the value for money in Spain um, is, is fantastic. OK, it is so it, you get world class wines in Spain and I'll show you some of the regions where we can really see some of these and um, compared to what you'd pay equivalent in France or in Italy, it's just so much cheaper. And the same thing with your top, top, top quality carvers. So this, I think this carver here, actually, um, I think that costs around 15 euros in, in Spain. So, you know, that's not bad at all. And you can see it's 2014 and uh, it's hand harvested, organic, you know, everything quite manual and they're, they're, they're brilliant wines, absolutely brilliant, really. And they got that and that's had quite a bit of time on the leaves. I'm pretty sure it's probably around four years or something. So that's got really nice autolytic character. So, yeah. Um, and they have a sense of place as well. You do pick up those kind of slightly like Charolot, kind of fennel, herby notes. Um, you get the citrus from the Macabal, you've got the floral from the Periada. Maybe there'll be a Chardonnay in there as well to give it a, um, again some sort of structure, structural elements. Anyway, great wine. So that's Carver. That's my Carver rant over. Um, and just, you know, be very, very aware that not all Carvers are equal. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about Catalonia. Now, Catalonia um, is really rather large. I'm not sure if the people of Catalonia would be upset. I'm calling this Mediterranean Spain when kind of Catalonia is vying for independence but I am going to talk quite a lot about Catalonia because I think it's an incredibly incredibly important um, wine region and 
I haven't listed every single um, GO or in fact it's actually a capital O, apologies, um, but I'm going to talk about the ones that I think are probably the most important um, and some of the stunning wines that you can get from them and you, you'll see that they're on this map here. So Costa del Segre is at, not contiguous at all, it's got three sort of separate parts, I'm going to talk about one in particular, it's a fascinating region. Then um, Penedes, as I mentioned before, because Penedes is, is the, really the home of Fukava. Okay, and you can see that some of it's by the coast and some of it's in the foothills of the Pyrenees, which is really important, and I'll make, talk about that. Monsant, so that's this kind of funny little ring there. Um, and then inside of Monsant, we've got Priorat. So I'll be talking about those um, four regions in particular. There are others. Um, so in Porta, which is actually right here, it's on the border of France. Okay, um, I'll talk about that um, a little bit. Um, we've got Yeda, um, Pla de Barge, Alea, um, Contra de Barbera, um, Paragona, Terra Alta. But to be honest with you, um, a lot of what's produced in these areas um, is for Cava as well. So they do make some lovely wines, um, but I want to talk about um, these other regions, those other four regions more because I think they've got a little bit more interest there but all very good value I mean you can get lovely wines from all of these regions but let's go into that in, in a moment so Costa del Segre now Costa del Segre is a really interesting um bio because it is basically the majority of it well just under the majority of it is owned by um Cordonia. Um, so the Reventos, Manuel Reventos um, is the founder of Cordonia, and um, they basically founded this site um, and their winery is Romat. And Romat um, are a really exciting, interesting winery. And they have got some elevation, as you can see, so 200 to 700 metres. Um, and we are, we are kind of further inland as well. So we've got those kind of um, slight foothills of the Pyrenees there. Now, because it doesn't retain water when it rains there, it is quite a tricky place to grow grapes. And when they first kind of, it was, I think it was the beginning of the 20th century when um, they kind of started thinking about growing grapes here, but it was really difficult. And in fact, they completely changed the landscape and sort of dug lakes, so these man-made lakes, which are there for the irrigation. So you'll see that um, they are, are watering their plants a lot. Another note, just to talk about irrigation in Spain, it's not been that long um, since they were actually they are actually allowed to irrigate. So, and it really depends on the regulatory body. So every DO in Spain has what you call a Consejo Regulador, and they determine what you can and cannot do. So the great varieties you can grow, whether you can irrigate or not. Now, generally you can irrigate, but there is generally usually some stipulation so when during the growing season you can irrigate um, you can only irrigate if the weather conditions mean that you have to that kind of thing but before it was a it was a firm no and now there is um, some movement there so Raventos was established in 19 and so Rimat, Rimat rather was established in 1978 and um, they've been making some fantastic wines ever since. And they're very easily available in, the, in that part of Spain, not so easily available in the UK so much. Um, and they make wines from your very sort of basic, easy drinking um, sort of red blends. So let's say, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon um, Tempranillo um, and sort of lighter bodied Chardonnays, because there's quite a lot of international grape varieties that are, are grown here. And all the way to some really top sort of styles of wines and what I really like about um, this um, producer this company is that they are very innovative and they are always trying new things so they were kind of growing these international grape varieties which you do see more in Catalonia because of the proximity to France but they were also looking at when to actually grow grape varieties and when to harvest them so this was in October I was in October now these are grapes that are close to being ripe okay um but they hadn't been harvested yet because what they were doing there so this is really fascinating if you're a bit of if you're doing the kind of high level studying or you're a bit bit wine geeky um you'll probably understand that there's a usual growing period for grapes okay so in the northern hemisphere uh, we have you know the spring time so coming up sort of um, april 
March, April, and then you get um, your shoots growing. And then in the, towards the summertime, you get the, um, the ripening of the grapes and then you're harvesting um, at the end of summer, beginning of the um, autumn. Um, but what they decided here was they wanted to completely change the growing season for this grape variety. They thought that actually the growing season wasn't quite right for this grape variety, Cabernet Sauvignon. So they decided that they were gonna sort of count it to start ripening later. Um, and then extend the ripening period to pick it much later. Anyway, it was all um, all quite revolutionary stuff, really. So I, I think it's fascinating to think that they've gone there, you know, quite a long time ago, dug out lakes um, to make sure they can irrigate. Then they're thinking about how they can actually change the cycle um, of the vine um, to produce wine. So, you know, may, maybe you think, oh, well, come on, that's a bit too much interference. But I, I think it's quite fascinating. So. The great varieties they're growing, so they are growing the Macabao, the Periada, the Charolot, we would expect that in many parts of Catalonia. Chardonnay is embraced, yeah, I think Chardonnay from um, Catalonia can be absolutely fantastic. I've had some really, really stunning examples. Garnacha Blanca, okay, so Garnacha Blanca, also grown um, in Rioja, grown um, in, um, in France, uh, where it would be called um, where it's Grenache Blanc, um, and we've also got it being grown um, in this part of the world as well. And that gives you, um, Ganache Blanca gives you kind of some peachy, melony characteristics. The acidity is around medium, um, but it gives some nice thickness to the wine. Um, and then Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Sauvignon Blanc as well, actually being very much um, appreciated and grown in Rioja, as well as in Rueda. So, you know, it's not, not just here. And then our black grape varieties, Garnacca, Tempranillo, Cabernet Sauvignon, like you can see, we've got some Cabernet Sauvignon in there, and Merlot too. And often they blend these grape varieties. Not to say they won't do single varietal wines, but there is blending going on. So um, that was our Costa de Sergre. So look out for them. They're not expensive wines generally, but I, I think um, very well made, but not expensive. Now, Penedes. So if we go back to that map quickly, I will take a there just briefly. We have got this region here and we've got the Mediterranean coast. We're bang on the Mediterranean coast here. Now, when you're close to the sea, you are quite low down. So bear that in mind. Um, then as you come away from the sea, you're starting to climb up until you're getting into the foothills of the Pyrenees there. So we are going to have quite, diverse, quite a diversity of climates. And as you go higher up, it gets cooler. So we can actually split it into three. Penedes Maritim, which is by the sea. Penedes Central, which is up to around 500 metres. And then above that, we're Penedes Superior. And so our, our grape varieties for Cava are grown at different heights. Um, I mentioned that before. Um, like about tending to be lower, then the Jarolo followed up high with the Periada. But what they also do is they make wines, um, they grow the grapes, that need cooler climates higher up. And because of that, you've got this real diversity of grape varieties being grown. Um, so at the bottom, um, you are going to grow your black grape varieties mostly because it's warmer there. So more of the uh, Monastrel. They do grow quite a bit of Monastrel down there. Um, your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Merlot, maybe some Tempranillo. As you go higher up, um, Tempranillo again, because it has like a more moderate climate, Pinot Noir. Um, and um, we're looking at, you know, again, those um, Carver varieties, Chardonnay. Um, and then as we go really high, so up to about kind of 800 metres, we're looking at the Wurtstraminer and Riesling. So Penedes, amazing. If you think about it, and there was a question asked on the Master of Wine paper a while ago, and they said, can you grow Cabernet Sauvignon and Riesling in the same region? Well, yes, if you're in Penedes. So you're Riesling at the top, your Cabernet Sauvignon at the bottom. So, I mean, it's an incredible diversity. And I just want to talk a little bit about why we might have this diversity and why we've got some really exciting winemaking happening in Penedes. Because one of the pioneers and actually changed the face of Spanish winemaking, basically from the 1970s, was Miguel Torres. So Miguel Torres is from Penedes. He went, learned um, about wine in Dijon, came back and started using things like stainless steel, introducing different grape varieties, um, and just really modernizing the uh, 
Spain and because it, it, Spain has had it had a bit of a checkered past with wine you know if we go back to um, there was a civil war there was a second world war you know there was economic um, issues under Franco there's been a lot of problems and then a lot of wine was being made but not particularly fantastic wine I mean Spain makes a lot of wine about third um, biggest wine making country it definitely has been um, and it's got loads and loads and loads of land under, under vine, the most um, of any country, but partly because a lot of the vines are grown at a distance from each other. I'll show you some photos in just a bit. But yeah, so it's had a bit of a checkered past, but you get this, this um, one man coming back and just saying, look at what we can do. And really that has changed um, the way um, we see wine in Spain. Because even though it's got a very, very old history and lots of tradition, particularly if you think about places like Jerez, um even though even because of the if, even though we have that actually what we're seeing now is quite modern really it's not like in france where you've got these regions like burgundy bordeaux the rhone and they've been doing things the same for so 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 long it's not really like that in spain so that's why one of the reasons i find it very very exciting but yeah penedes i think a fantastic region a fantastic video for just showing you what can happen but of course we are in the north and we do have altitude so this isn't going to be something you can do all over Spain. Right so now we're going to move a bit further down a bit further south in um, and over a little bit to the east in Catalonia and I'm going to talk about Monsant and next one, no, the next one okay so Monsant now Monsant um, is right next to Priora and I'm going to go into quite a bit of detail with Priora um, in just a moment. Monsant kind of circles um, Priora. It does get some Mediterranean influence from it. It's not quite as warm as, as some parts of, um, of Priora. Some parts of it are quite a bit further away um, from the Mediterranean. But it's, I think, a very overlooked Bio in Catalonia because it produces some fantastic wines and not absolutely high prices. And if you like the wines of Priorat, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, then I think you will like the wines of Monsant because they're not that similar. When you can get high up, so above 300 meters or so, then we do start to see um, more acidity in the in the wines and wines that are a bit better for longer aging. Um, the soil types are really varied. They've got clay, they've got sand, they've got this yucorea, which I'm going to talk about a bit in the next slide, um, which is a, a shiny um, sort of mica-based soil type. Um, and where they've got parcels of that and where they've got a bit more altitude, they are making some fantastic, fantastic wines. And their grape varieties are very similar to what we're going to see in the next slide as well. So they've got the Garnacha being sort of raining here, Carignana, I'll talk about in a moment. Campanillo, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah and Merlot. And then they do make some white, but it's predominantly red. So you can see very beautiful part um, of the world there, Monsanto. So I'm going to talk really more about Priorat because Monsanto is a bit like, I kind of see Monsanto as sort of the younger sibling, if you like, um, of, of Priorat. So Priorat, here we go, Priorato. Um, it's a DOQ. So I've been talking about Nominato and Dorahen. So you might have heard of a denominator of Lorraine Calafacada. Um, so that would be a DOCA. So Rioja is a DOCA. And Priorat is what we might call a DOCA, but we are in Catalonia. So we call it a DOQ because we've got a different language. So same word really, um, but beginning with Q. Now, it became a DOQ in 2009. It was an area that was abandoned, particularly during the Civil War. And then in Catalonia, there was a big textile business and it just made more sense for people to move into that rather than sort of slave um, over these very, very steep slopes and rocky terrains. Um, it was not really the, the nicest or easiest thing to do to be winemaker in Priorat. So it's kind of abandoned and then was sort of re- um, rediscovered in I think 1989 by a group of winemakers and it was kind of a little gang um, so one of them was René Barbier who's one of the pioneers in fact we have relatives in London not far from me who sell his wine so that's nice I've met met the cousins um, so René Barbier there's Alvaro Palacios you may have heard of him so these are two particularly well-known winemakers making some um, absolutely stunning wines in Priorat. Um, there's Christopher Cannon as well, an English gentleman. And in fact, this is his cellar, one of his cellars there. 
Clodovigorous, um, beautiful wines. So um, there's a group, they kind of pioneered, started it, and then, you know, it was clear that there was some fabulous wine to be made. And this fabulous wine, it wasn't easy because like I've mentioned before, we've got this quite difficult terrain. It's very steep in places. I don't think I'm showing you the steepest bits. They've got these um, terraces, sort of stone terraces. Uh, you need to use donkeys <laughs> to try and get around there. Um, and also the vines are really, really old. Okay, so like they encourage these very old wines, like 75 year old what vines. And how much fruit are you going to get off a 75 year old vine? So you, the yields are ridiculous. I think the minimum requirement is quite low anyway, so like 39 hectolitres a hectare, but we're looking more at like five, six hectolitres a hectare. That's like, you know, barely a bottle of vine. So very, very, very small yield. Um, Again, we've got, I've talked about the Yikorea soil, so they love their Yikorea soil. Um, it has got this it's kind of a quartzy, shiny, you know, glimmers, um, shimmers, all that kind of stuff. But they do have quite a bit of altitude going up to 750 meters. Um, so taking you fairly high, quite a lot of it is quite high. It's very hilly and you get these mists as well. So you get these kind of mists coming in from the Mediterranean, which really help to cool down um, over sort of early morning and keep the acidity. So what you get from these wines um, is just an incredible concentration and acidity, which gives you a style of wine, unlike pretty any other you're gonna get when it comes to Garnacha. So I'm gonna talk about the style of wine in just a moment, because it's a particular style of wine, which I think is really, really wonderful. Now I've just got here the rainfall. Now we're gonna be interesting to see, as we go further south, we're gonna notice that the rainfall becomes less and less and less. So 500, 600 millimeters average rainfall. Yeah, that's, that's, that's okay, that's good. Um, you know, we, we do probably don't need to irrigate too much, um, but we'll see how it goes down as we go further um, south. So Garnacha Tinder being the main grape variety, followed by Carignana. So Carignana, you might know as Carignan. Um, so that is also grown in France. So generally in the south of France, Carignan and Garnacha, or Carignana and Garnacha need hot, uh, hot, quite hot climates. So it does work quite well here and um, this proximity to the Mediterranean. Um, they do grow some, they have incorporated some international grape varieties, not too much. You don't see too much of the blend. Um, and then about 6% of what is made um, is white wine. And don't overlook the white wines of, um, of Priorat. They can be stunning. And Garnacha Blanca and Macabao are those wines. Now they do like their oak, as we can probably see from this photo. Okay, so quite a bit of new oak is being used. I think that didn't used to be so much the case, but it can take it. Um, and what you get, a very concentrated, high tannin, high acidity, um, sort of baked fruit, dried fruit, um, wines with huge, huge aging um, capacity, really, really top ones. So La Mita by Alvaro Palacios, um, Clo Magador by um, René Barbier, just a couple to name out of there. Some of the most expensive wines in Spain, in fact. Um, now, they have got their own um, kind of classification as well. So uh, we've got V de Villa. Now, V de Villa um, is, is a, is a labelling term which refers to the 12 subtones of um, pre so the 12 subzones, and you can put the name of that subzone on there rather than if you're blending across subzones. The name of that. Then we've got Vida Paraje. Now we've seen that word before because that was with the carver. So this actually would be a specific place, a named site. Okay, so like in France, they call that a lieu de, a named place. And there's quite a lot of those. There's um, 459. Then we get to this, this is kind of a Burgundian thing. And if you saw the Rioja one I did a while ago, we were talking about the future of Rioja and they're kind of going down that road a little bit there. Then we've got Vigna Classificada. Now Vigna Classificada is now sort of from a specific vineyard. Um, and so that is kind of what we would call a crew. Okay, so kind of at crew level. And then Grand Vigna Classificada is like your Grand Cru level. So we're very much getting very Burgundian with our labelling terms. And of course, these are going to become more expensive and more site specific. They become. So um, a little bit about Priorat there. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful place um, and fantastic wine. Okay, so I can see there's questions coming thick and fast. And I hope that um, Julia is able to help there or make a note and I'll, I'll try and answer them at the end if possible. So 
I mean, I do have a bit of a bias, I think, possibly towards Catalonia, because I do go there when I can um, in the summer. Um, I try to go every year. And I tend to actually stay near um, in the Emporda area. So I'm a bit of a fan. Again, they grow lots of different great varieties in Emporda. You know, it's not too dissimilar to be a bit further down um, in Penedes. And one of the bigger producers there, actually, you can see, is um, Perilada. I'm not to be confused with the grape variety, Pariada. Um, and they actually make some beautiful carva and they make some really stunning red wines. I think this is one of their more entry level um, reds, but look at that funky bottle, really lovely. <laughs> Shouldn't touch a wine by its labels, but uh, this is cool when they that pretty. Um, but no, they make some very, very serious wines as well. So they do the whole shebang, you know, big Garnacho wines um, and Cabernet Sauvignon blends often, also carva. And, and um, they like make and then there's some very light white wines that are made there as well, using Malvasir. Um, so, you know, lots and lots of interesting stuff going on there and not expensive and lovely with the seafood. I mean, you buy the sea, you want these light whites um, as well. Um, but, you know, you've got gorgeous tapas as well. Let's not forget uh, some very nice meat dishes as well. I mean, you know, the opportunities for pairing are endless. As I mentioned before, a lot of these are to do with um, carver production. Um, I've had some beautiful carvers just from Yeda and Alea, for example. Um, and Con um, Conca de Barbera um, is uh, the great variety that they use to make a lot of the Rosado um, styles. So yeah, each each have got their own thing going on, um, but probably not quite as exciting as the regions I've already shown you. Right, so I did say that I wanted to talk about Somontano. Um, so this is not in Catalonia, this is neighboring Aragon, but in Aragon there are some other um, DOs. So we've got Campo de Borja, Carignana, and Calasso. Carignana, very confusing, because of course we've seen that Carignana is the name of a grape variety. And weirdly in Carignana, they don't really plant much Carignana. But that's by the by, I'm not talking about those regions. I'm talking about Somontano. And Somontano, as you can see, is actually pretty close to Catalonia, therefore a bit more Mediterranean. And I just feel like Somontano deserves a bit of attention because it's overlooked and it makes some lovely wines, lovely clean, pure wines from again a range of different grape varieties including quite a few of these um, international grape varieties but also can we see we have Alcanon, Moristel and Paraletta which are all native grape varieties and two native to Somontano and were nearly um, became extinct particularly after all those troubling times um, with civil war and, um, and world wars, etc. So they have got specific grape varieties just for those regions, but they are very small production. Um, but what I would say is one of the things they do very, very well are the international grape varieties. So they've got both sides of the coin there, but the international grape varieties, they do incredibly well. Like I said before, in Penedes as well, they do them really, really well. The problem is you are in competition with the rest of the world when you start growing Chardonnay and Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc and Gewurz Tramina. Although the Gewurz Tramina does win quite a lot of medals. It's very, very varietally defined, really, really lovely. But when you taste it, are you going to go, this is from Somontano? No, because it's not really that kind of region. And so that's something that needs to be worked on a bit, getting them a little bit more of an identity. But the wines that are made are really, really lovely. They've got some fantastic, um, producers there and a lot of growers and they're doing some really great stuff but it's just kind of overlooked because of just the, the mass competition around the world really so we've got 500 millimeters of rainfall so you know decent amounts there um in sandstone, sandstone mainly soils and some good altitude we are in actually somontano actually means under the mountain so we are really by those pyrenees there um, and so Pinot Noir as well. Um, so some really nice range of wines. Some of these are blends, some of these are varietal, but yeah, uh, one, one to look out for. Okay, so now I am traveling quite a bit south. So jumping down a little bit, um, and we're in the kind of overriding area of Valencia. Um, so Valencia, now we can see we've got a drop um, in our rainfall, so 450 millimetres rainfall, so it is quite important to irrigate um, at this level. 
We've got within Valencia actually a subzone called Alto Turia. When I think of the south of Spain, I think of the southeast coast of Spain, I think of big alcoholic red wines. But actually, there's quite a lot of white wine produced there. And um, this subzone, um, it, the main grape varieties are Murciaguera. It's not the most exciting grape variety, to be honest, but it does make, you know, some nice, pleasant um, white wines and Macabal, which we know about because that's a grape variety that was grown for carver production and has a, a nice, apple citrusy notes. So um, that's one. But otherwise, um, in Valencia, um, we do have a lot of Monastrell, which I'm going to talk about um, in just a bit. So um, we've got Muscatel Valencia. So Muscatel is its own bio, and the Muscat, this is Muscat. Now, if you've had Muscat before, um, Muscat is um, a very, very aromatic grape variety. So it's very grapey, floral, peachy, and they make a 15% alcohol wine there, so fortified. And it's really cheap. I was, I was, um, I haven't had it before, but I knew I'd heard that they did do this Muscatel. So I was a bit, I was a bit wondering what it would like. You know, is it, is it going to be similar to the kind of Muscats you get in the south of France? So if you've ever had, you know, your Reef Salt Muscat, that kind of thing. And I think it probably is quite similar. So it tends to be a youthful style of fortified wine, and um, fifteen percent alcohol. Um, but it's so inexpensive. So I've seen you can buy it in the supermarket here for like around six pounds a bottle. Um, but yeah, so that's something that's unique to that particular part of Spain there. And then we've got Uchel Ricana. Now, Uchel Ricana um, is something better. <laughs> um, it has been seen to have a reputation for fairly basic Bobal wines. Now, Bobal, you saw, was um, the uh, third most planted grape variety in Spain, and most of it is grown down in this part of Spain. And actually, next door, um, we've got another region, uh, Mantrello, but uh, um, it's, we're, we're not really Mediterranean there. But Bobal, um, particularly old vine Bobal, is getting a lot more attention. It makes nice rosés, and you get a nice rosé, but actually um, it makes some very nice, it's got good acidity, it's got good tannin. It doesn't always look that dark, interestingly, but it can make some very lovely wine. So it's worth looking out for Bobal, and it's not expensive at all. There's some really good producers doing some really good stuff there. Um, then we've got Alicante Dio, which is kind of dotted around. And again, we um, are talking Monastrell mostly, um, like with actually the red Valencia wine. So mostly Monastrell. Monastrell is a great variety. Morpedra is also known as. It's also one of the great varieties you're allowed to use um, for carver, um, to make white carvers in, um, and, and the rosés. But uh, not very much of it is used for carver. But down here, it can make some really big wines because the alcohol levels can get pretty high. Um, but uh, we'll have a look at the next region um, for those particularly high alcohol levels. Um, we've also got some other great varieties, which you might think, well, we're in Alicante, we've got Alicante Boucher. Alicante Boucher is a really interesting grape variety. It is a black grape variety. The skin is black and the inside is black as well, so that the pulp um, is black. Um, well, it's got um, sort of ready, colourful um, pulp, which you don't usually get. Next time you have a grape, which is a black grape, peel the skin and you'll see the inside. It looks green and it's got some transparent liquid. Not the case of Alicante Boucher. What that can do is add real colour um, to wines. Um, so we call that kind of grape variety a tempurier, where it means the inside um, has got colour. And then, of course, Garnacha and Bobal. I mean, they all um Tempranillo actually down here is called Sensibel, so C-E-N-C-I-B-E-L. And then up in Catalonia, it's got another name. It's called Ue de Liebre, which means eye of the hare, as in like rabbit hair. Um, so yeah, some interesting synonyms around Spain for Tempranillo. Okay, um, and have a look at this. Look how widely apart um, these vines are. You can see these kind of sandy soils. This is very low density planting, and that's why Spain has got a lot of land under the vine, but doesn't actually produce the most wine. So it's got the most land under vine, but doesn't produce the most wine because the vines are so far apart. But that's so necessary in this part of the world where it's getting more and more arid, less water, so it's got to fight for that water, um, and 
you don't want to have loads and loads of vines there all fighting together and not getting what they need, like here as well. Um, and can you see that here we've got this kind of very limestoney, pale um, soil type as well. It looks a little bit like um, the soil you get in Jerez, um, that um, Albarita soil. Now here it's 300 millimetres of rainfall, so you can see why they need to plant these so far apart. I think we've got a bit of the mesita over there. And you can get up to 18% alcohol wines with Monastrel grown in Humea, which is crazy. So it really is a challenge to try not to have that alcohol level in your wine because uh, no one wants big alcoholic soup, as my colleague Michael Buriak might say. Um, so you want to bring that those levels down um, and probably pick a bit earlier. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've had some Easily, I've had some 15%. That was quite high enough. Thank you very much. But that doesn't mean you get these very rich, full bodied wines, lots of baked, dried fruit character. Um, and they can have really can be um, done very, very well. So, Juan Gil are um, the family Juan Gil, they have wineries all over Spain and they do some fantastic um, Humia wines um, with, at different levels of oaking um, with their top wine in their portfolio having spent quite a few months on oak and that's a very nice wine. Another thing they're doing in Humia and actually in the south of um, Spain is growing more and more Syrah and Syrah usually I wouldn't expect it to grow so well in such a hot climate um, but it does pretty well down here and I'm seeing it more and more kind of labelled as Shiraz. They're giving the Australians a run for their money. That's, uh, that's definitely the case because that's the kind of style you're looking at. It's not your own kind of style. It's more of a, of a new world style, very fruit forward, lots of lovely black fruit, um, licorice-y, um, chocolatey notes coming through there. Um, so Yekla, right next to Humia, very similar to Humia, um, but they don't sell a lot of their wine domestically. So a lot of that gets um, exported, 95%, quite a high amount. And that's again, Monastrel. Um, and then Gulas, um, which again is very, very similar, but maybe not quite as exciting um, as what's going on in Humia. Um, lots of fun stuff um, happening in Humia as well. They have like festivals for wine and yeah, really nice part of the world. Definitely to go on holiday. Um, maybe not in bang in August, but uh, just outside those those times of the year. Um, now, if I'm going to talk about Mediterranean Spain, I have to mention the island, don't I? So, um, and this is a bit of a learning thing for me because I've actually not been to Balearic Islands. Um, I really want to. It just haven't hasn't um, happened. Um, and I, you know, island wines are really interesting. You see these parts of the world like. Santorini, Greece, where they've got their vines made into baskets. You've got the um, Canary Islands, where you've got the stone walls um, on these volcanic soils protecting the grapes um, as well. So, you know, and sand dunes and all sorts of amazing stuff. It looks like they've been growing sand dunes, all sorts of amazing stuff. I'm always excited by um, these kind of wines. And also, of course, because they're islands, you get a lot of indigenous grape varieties. So we've got Manso Negro and Calet, for example, um, which makes very nice, fragrant wines. So Calet um, is simply blended together. But again, you know, these are native grape varieties um, making something a little bit different. Um, and other native well, white grapes, we've got Moll, or what is also called a Prinsal Blanc, too. Um, I don't know much about them because there isn't much out there. Um, but all I know is Calette is quite fragrant and light um, and blended with Manso Negro. And then we've got, again, the other great varieties that we'd expect. And um, two quite, um, there's, there's a few DOs on the Valeric Islands, but these are the two most important ones, Minisalim and Plai Levant, referring to the Levant um, part of Spain and, and that, that drying wind that comes through. So that's um, pretty much a little whistle, top, whistle stop tour from the north Mediterranean to the South um, Mediterranean. Of course, there are many other DOs, but you know, just to give you an idea of the diversity and the range of wines, um, I hope that that was interesting. Um, um, I've got, I'm ready for some questions now. Just if you haven't seen this before, we've got lots of uh, handles there. So if you want to talk about this or anything else, um, please feel free to, to use them. Okay, so I will stop sharing my screen. And I'll stop the recording as well. And 